Hello, and welcome to the Bamboo Lab Podcast with your host, Peak Performance Coach, Brian Bosley. Are you stuck on the hamster wheel of life, spinning and spinning, but not really moving forward? Are you ready to jump off and soar? Are you finally ready to sculpt your life? If so, you've landed in the right place. This podcast is created and broadcast just for you. All of you strivers, thrivers, and survivors out there. If you'd like to learn more about Brian and the Bamboo Lab, feel free to reach out to explore your true peak level at www.bamboolab3.com. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of the Bamboo Lab podcast. As always, I'm your host, Brian Bosley. We have a pretty cool guest on today, folks. Um, You know, a lot of you know, especially the people that I communicate with uh, on a personal level, that I do a lot of traveling in the state of Michigan. And probably typically the last year, year and a half, I've been gone two to three weeks each each month. And I spend a lot of time in Grand Rapids or Lansing or sometimes in the, the Detroit area. And every time I have an opportunity and someone says, where do you want to go for lunch or where do you want to go for a beer? I almost always say Hopcat. One of my favorite places ever to go in, um, I've been to three or four locations in the state of Michigan already. So what a better now, what, who's better to bring on than the actual CEO of, the, of this massive, growing enterprise of Hopcat? So today we have a gentleman I've gotten to know very well over the past few months. I have a lot of respect for him. We have more in common than we possibly, it, it seems almost too coincidental as he and I talk. But today, folks, we have Craig Stage on. And Craig, my new friend, welcome to the Bamboo Lab podcast. Brian, I, I really appreciate this is actually a really cool opportunity as someone who, you know, this is my first podcast that I've been on and someone who listens to a ton of podcasts. So, but yeah, it's been actually pretty amazing uh, as we continue to talk uh, pretty much weekly here, the more stuff that I learn about you and how many similarities and how much, how many connections we have, obviously with you being a fellow Uper uh, has been really fun to, fun to talk to you over the last few months. So those who don't know people, Upers are us folks who were born and raised or born or maybe live here now in the upper peninsula of Michigan, one of the most beautiful, more uh, scenic areas of our country. I, I, and I've seen a lot of them. This is one of the most beautiful places. I was born here. Craig was born here. I had the privilege three years ago of moving back up here after being gone, gone for 30 some years. So that was one similarity. What was another one, Craig? Well, I think that we had, you know, just different things. You were talking about some land that you had owned in the UP. It was not far from the land that I, you know, that I still go back to where my family lives. Um, So obviously a lot of different outdoors things that you participate in. I know that you're very active. You like to run. I've been pretty inconsistent with that, but have definitely been getting back into it. You know, it's really important to me to get to the gym and, you know, make sure that my health is, is maintaining, especially as I just turned 40 this year. So, um, but yeah, so it's been between your, you know, you obviously knowing a lot about Hopcat, been, been to a handful of different locations. And then the UP connection is, is usually pretty unique for me to find, you know, someone from the UP down here, let alone, you know, someone that, that actually is born and raised. A lot of people don't even know what the UP is no, unfortunately, I know. in the I, Midwest. I have a lot of uh, clients or, or friends around the country that will, they will text me. They'll use the, the term Uper, but they'll spell it U P E R. So if those who don't know, Uper is actually spelled Y O O P E R. But I have a lot of clients who tease me for being a Uper, but they'll spell it wrong. So the joke's on them. Well, there's a couple other things. We both have a passion for leadership, and we yeah, both yep. love the University of Michigan football program. Yes, we do. <laughs> and they play a big game tomorrow night. By the time this airs, will be over. We'll know who won between them and Washington. But I've got Michigan winning by ten. I agree. I think that they should. I mean, even though it's a road game, I think they're going to take care of business. Their offense is struggling a bit, but I think that they're going to be able to get enough done to, to get the W there in Washington. Well, we'll find out because if they lose, we're going to get a lot of. I'm going to get a lot of emails and texts from people in Washington if they lose yeah. by, after before this airs. So, so anyway, Craig, I've gotten to know a lot about you over the past few months. Can but can you please share with the Bamboo Pack members out there a little bit about yourself, your childhood, your family, uh, growing up, who or what inspired you, whatever you want to share. Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned, I I did turn 40 this year. Uh, I think that that, you know, I haven't had a lot of birthdays where, you know, you have the, the, the midlife crisis thoughts or anything like that. Obviously the 40 has been probably the biggest, 
you know, probably the, the most eye opening one for me to really kind of take a step back and evaluate what's important to me. You know, even like I said, just making sure that I'm maintaining my health and getting to the gym as much as I possibly can. Um, but it's also been the last couple of years of my life have been really incredible, uh, for some opportunities that I've been given. I also met, uh, in the last two years, I've met my wife, uh, and I've also had, uh, a baby girl named Fiona. So we had her December 11th of 2023 and it's just been a blur. And then in the midst of all of that, uh, the company that I've been with for 10 years, I just, I, I think I crossed my 10 year threshold in September of this year. Um, but I was given the opportunity to take over as a CEO of, of the company, which, you know, if you would have told me that five years ago, I, I, I don't think I would have believed you. Um, but just continuing to really be grateful for all the different positive things that have happened to me over the last couple of years. Well, so, but, you, OK, can I ask you one question? When you say you would never have thought this five years ago, what five years well, ago, what would you have thought? Well, I would say that, so 10 years ago, I was hired in to be the restaurant manager of Hopcat Detroit. We were opening the new Midtown location, and I had had some general manager experience, which I'll kind of go over here in a minute, but I think that I I really have just been amazed by the opportunities that have arisen just by putting my head down and, and really working hard and really trying to stay, you know, high character, do the right thing, make sure I'm you know, keeping in mind our guests, but our employees at the same time. And I think that, you know, as we've kind of gone through a lot, just like a lot of restaurant groups, especially in, in Michigan, um, you know, going through COVID, you know, we did also go through in 2020, we, our company filed chapter 11 bankruptcy and we were bought out of bankruptcy by, by a couple of investors. And, you know, so there was a lot of uncertainty, um, especially around four to five years ago. And so to go through, you know, being a restaurant manager for a couple of years and then moving out to Lincoln, Nebraska to take over as a general manager to open our location out there. And then from Lincoln, Nebraska, I moved to Kalamazoo and took over as a general manager there. And then from the, from there, I moved to our Royal Oak location and took over as the, the GM there. And at the time, that was our managing, manager and training location. And we were growing extremely quickly. So every manager that was you know coming on board to our company went through training and I was kind of the leader of that training. So, you know, I was very focused on being in the restaurants. And then from there, uh, I was promoted to be a multi-unit director. So at that point in time, I took over the east side locations of, you know, East Lansing, Ann Arbor, Detroit, and then the Royal Oak location. And so, you know, again, just, you know, the step from being an area director to becoming a CEO is obviously a big one. And so, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to work uh, with a guy named Ned Lidball, who was our previous CEO. Uh, Ned is actually uh, based out of Atlanta. And so, um, you know, Ned has had a wealth of experience over the years. Um, and kind of when he came on board with us, it wasn't supposed to be for a super long term. Um, but he ended up staying on board, helping us through the bankruptcy as there's a lot of different things to navigate through that process. And then, you know, he just kind of got to the point where, you know, it just it just made more sense. You know, obviously him traveling up here every week or every other week from Atlanta has been really challenging. And so, um I've just been really lucky. Uh, you know, I do, you know, fully believe that I've worked very hard to get to where I am, but a lot of things have happened for me. I, you know, I joined the company really at the exact perfect right time, um, coming on board for our fourth location at the time being Detroit. And then from, you know, the years of 2014 to 2018, uh, I believe we opened something like eight or nine locations in that time frame. So clearly when you're opening that many locations, a lot of additional leadership positions open up. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I meant. Just a lot of, a lot of things had to fall correctly. And, you know, I, I always joke to, to a lot of our team members when I talk to them or if I introduce myself for the first time, you know, I, I, like I said, I worked really hard to get here, but I also had a lot of luck and a lot of opportunities given to me by some people that were really talented um, as I worked with them along the way. Well, the one thing I've been impressed with, and I hear, I do hear this a lot from CEOs or top level executives, is when I ask them, you know, questions like, "What's the imprint you want to leave on your legacy? What imprint do you want to leave on the company?" You know, what's and a lot of people will say the people, but it seems like with you and with Barfly, which is for folks who don't know, that's the company that we that you're technically the CEO of, correct? Yeah, and yeah. it runs the uh, Barfly's in charge of the. Hopcats and Stella's downtown Grand Rapids, which is one of my favorite places uh, when I live there as well. Um, but it seems like with you and with Hopcat, 
that seems to be an overriding message overall. It does seem to be a working. It's not just a mantra. It is kind of a. It's it's in the field as well, or at least you're doing everything you can to get that more and more prevalent in the in the in the Hopcat community. That the people are the most important. The people who work there, the guests who come in, the experiences they all have. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's so easy to say, but it's really challenging to do. And so, you know, I think that you have the you have the luxury of watching a lot of these large companies around us and they, you know, and again, since the pandemic, a lot of them have really struggled, you know, the Applebee's of the world, the Chili's of the world, uh, you know, even places like, you know, Ruby Tuesdays and places like that, where there's a lot of restaurants closing all over the country. It's really easy for them to say, but they clearly, I don't think have done a great job of really truly living by that mantra. And for us, I believe that we're the perfect size company to, to understand how important our people are. And for me coming through as, you know, solely an operator who ran a lot of shifts over the last 10 years and, you know, really kind of grinded with a lot of our employees over the years and, you know, working the nights and working the weekends, it's just, it can be a really thankless job at times. And it is incredibly important to me to never lose that connectivity and never lose the understanding of what our teams go through every day and how hard of a job that it can be um, knowing that, you know, sometimes you get busy when you're not really prepared for it. Sometimes you have people not show up for work and the managers have to lock in and work hourly positions. And so I, I just could not say enough. And again, I, I've said this to our operators a lot as well. Words are not enough a lot of times, right. To really truly explain how much somebody means to us as an organization and how much work that these folks do behind the scenes, how much work they do actually on the floor in front of our guests, back in the kitchens, et cetera. And so, we have to continue to to really build our company and everything needs to be for these people that are in the restaurants every single day. Well, I think you're right. And I think I've been guilty of this too. You know, when you're busy and you're going to lunch or you're going with friends after work for a few drinks or whatever you're doing, you go into a, into a, a place, an establishment like Hopcap, you tend to, you, you, don't, you tend not to really even pay attention to the, 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 the wait staff or, you know, the, the kitchen staff or the bartenders or the bus, you know, the, food runners, the, the bus boys and bus girls, you, you tend to just, you're so locked in on your conversation and your your reason to be there, whether you have an hour or whether you're there for two or three hours to watch a football game. It's, 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 it's good for people like us, the guests who come in to pay attention to the people who are actually there working and to see them on a th- that third dimensional level. Because we see people two-dimensionally so often and way too often. And sometimes we need to. I can't drive down the highway and can p- picture every single person I'm driving by. But when you're in an establishment, sometimes it's good to just stop and look around and say, these people work pretty damn hard. <laughs> they really do. Yeah. And they give their best most of the time. I was a bartender you know, through college and in the summers, and I, I get it. It's, it's, it can be a thankless job. And you don't get a lot of great jobs from the customer, from the guest. You get a lot more of the, hey, you poured my drink wrong, or hey, this food's wrong, or our bill's not right. And it's good to stop back and look at the, the, the staff and say, wait a minute, they're doing everything they can. They're working. Right now, they're working a lot harder than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, that part of it is also important for us to, to remember, too. And actually, you and I have talked about this recently, how, you know, it's, it's such a great job to have at times, right, where you have people coming in and they might be celebrating a uh, wedding anniversary or a birthday, or they're coming here after a graduation. And, you know, sometimes you get these folks and some of their happiest moments and some of their happiest memories, and they're coming in and they're, they're celebrating that with us, with our team. And so it is extremely important to us and for our team members to make sure that they keep that front of mind as well as they're navigating the difficulties of the jobs at times. Right. I mean, we do know that there's, there's things that pop up, there are tough guests at times, but at the same time, they're not, they're, jo- they're coming here to die your ass. They're coming here to have some food and drink They're It's, it's not their job to worry about how many tables a server has, or, you know, maybe we did have a call off in the kitchen and it's causing us to run up a little bit longer ticket times. It's not the guest's job to, to have to worry about that. It's our job to make sure that they come in and have a fantastic time every single time they walk into a hop cat. And, you know, that can sound a lot easier. <laughs> it's easier said than done at times, but, but again, I, I feel confident that, that our teams, uh, you know, almost always have, have our guest best interest at heart. And, you know, if, a, if an employee doesn't, it, it's usually, you know, not a good fit. And maybe, maybe they have to, you know, we have to have to move on from us. But at the same time, we, we just try to try our best again to just make sure that we're, we're seeing the job through the eyes of our guests, but also through the eyes of our employees. 
Right. Well, I think, you know, one of the things I liked about Hopcat is every time I've gone to the one in Grand Rapids, which, which is the one I probably have been to more than any other, uh, followed by East Lansing location, I always see somebody I know in there. And it's always somebody different. It's always somebody I didn't expect to see that I maybe haven't seen in a while. I remember I walked in two year and a half ago. I was on a first date and walked in and my friend Lee and her husband were sitting at the bar having dinner because the place was packed. And, and we were getting seated upstairs in the upstairs lo- uh, part there. And uh, it was just like, why don't I come here more often? And it was so funny that then I started going to the East Lansing one again. And then you and I started talking and, and getting to know each other. And I, it's, it's definitely my favorite. I wouldn't, it's not really called a sports bar, is it? What do you, it's a micro bar. No, it's, a, it's a brew pub. Brew pub. Yeah, it's definitely, so we call it kind of a, you know, we, we've always kind of coined ourselves as the best craft beer bar. And so, you know, clearly uh, we carry a lot of unique craft beer. Yeah, you Craft do. beer obviously was booming back when we first opened, and we've had to get creative with making sure that we're adjusting our offerings. You know, we have uh, our beverage director, uh, Justin Pollock, who has done a good job of keeping us extremely relevant uh, from the cocktail side of things as well. Um, but yeah, so it's, we don't really coin ourselves as a sports bar. We are obviously open in a lot of universities, uh, around Michigan. And so places like East Lansing, places like Ann Arbor, clearly the game's going to be on there this weekend, right? If any of those folks are playing. Um, but it, it wasn't initially opened as kind of a sports bar focus, but we often will have sports on it. Yeah. Not. Yeah. It's, I, I like the term hop cat cause it, it seems like at, the ones I go into are always hopping. Yeah, I mean, it's we, we do our best to maintain a, a lively atmosphere, for sure. So, ask you, I'm going to go back a little bit to your childhood, because you grew up in a small town. Yeah, Can you extremely talk small. On that? Yeah. yeah, I would love to. Um, you know, it's funny, as you're, as you're growing up, you, you know, whether you're in junior high, you're, you're going into high school, you're getting closer to your junior and senior year, I think it's a it's really easy to be able to find the things that you didn't like about where you grew up, especially when you grew up in such a small town. But yeah, so I'm from a a little town called Kearney, Michigan, obviously in the UP. And I graduated high school with 23 people. And I can tell you if, uh, if you drove, you know, down us 41 and you, uh, you know, you were sitting in the passenger seat and maybe you dropped your phone in between the door and the, and the chair, you could reach down and find your phone and you would, you, you would miss the, the city if you were driving through it. Cause it doesn't take long. Um, but I, I can tell you I, now that I've gained perspective, uh, as I get older, you know, I've lived away from there now for, uh, I moved away when I was 20. So it's going on 20 years. Um, there's so many things that were just incredible growing up there. Uh, you know, my family being the first one, we had a very, and we still do have a very tight knit family. You know, I grew up uh, one mile from my my grandparents on my mom's side. They were a huge part of my life. Obviously, but I also grew up just a few miles from my grandparents on my dad's side, which were also extremely crucial in my ability to spend a ton of time with them growing up, especially in the summertime as my parents both worked. It was just, just incredible. I, I grew up a mile away from my cousins. We all lived out in a country road. So I was able to sort of, you know, grow up around them. They were all, you know, at least four years older than me. So I always felt like I had a little bit of a cheat code on I'm just growing up and, and being a little bit more in tune with, you know, social skills and stuff that I learned from them growing up. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, we were a ki- kindergarten through 12 is all in one school, uh, which, you know, is pretty abnormal for even some other schools in the UP. Uh, I went with, the, out of the 23 that I graduated high school with, nine of them were with me starting in kindergarten and we did it all from K all the way through 12. Um, you know, clearly uh, athletics were, were fantastic, had good coaches. Uh, you know, it wasn't really a lot of times where you had to make the team. Um, so you were usually just on the team. If you went out, you were on the team. So, um, but yeah, I mean, my, my memory of the UP and and obviously my family still lives there. So I go back often. Um, but I just can't say enough about how tight knit of a community it was, how, I mean, I don't, I don't remember locking our door ever my entire life growing up. Uh, it's not something you had to worry about. But the community feeling and, and how much everybody is there for each other. Um, and again, just, you know, having the, the the family that I had. I mean, everywhere I looked, you know, every family has has their, their struggles, right? But everywhere I looked around my family, on both my mom and my dad's side, I had the most incredible uh, people to look to for, um, you know, really true role models growing up. And it, I feel really 
uh, I'm really lucky to have had that. Do you feel that that community feeling you had growing up in Kearney with your family living so closely, has that had a big impact on how you have, as you've taken over the reins as CEO of Hopcat and Stella's, has that made a, an impact on how you lead the people? Yeah, I think I think anybody that would say that their their upbringing and where they live growing up didn't have an impact on how they act professionally and in their professional life, I think they'd be crazy, right? And so the the way that our I don't want to belabor this too much, but it's really hard to even explain. And I think that you probably have a pretty good idea, even though Sault Ste. Maria is a much bigger city than where I'm from. St. Ignace. But the, or St. Ignace, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm not a blue devil. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, the, the way you learn how to treat each other and whether it's through, uh, you know, good times or bad. And I think that you really learn, uh, you know, just, how to be able to, to really look for the positives in people and, and really try to avoid the negatives of people, you know, with people and, you know, try to take, you know, if somebody does have an opportunity to take that and strengthen it rather than to focus on it and think of it as, as something that's not, um, you know, something that we can, we can overcome. Right. And so I just, I, I, I cannot tell you enough, you know, my, my grandparents on my mom's side, um, my group, we actually just lost my grandpa this year. He was 96 oh. and my grandma is still alive. Uh, she's also 96, but they were married for 76 years. And you know, that, that's just, I, I haven't heard many that have, that have made it that many years, obviously with both of them being in great health for that long, but the admiration that I have and had for them growing up who Truly, when you want to talk about setting the tone for a family and being role models and showing you the right way to do things, I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I just, I am, I'm still baffled by, by how they have lived their life and, and how, um, just any good attribute you can possibly think of my grandparents had. And, and, and you know, to be honest, and so did my parents. Um, but, but overall, it's just been, uh, I feel really grateful and I will be actually heading up north in about a month, uh, for our yearly, I, I do hunt uh, whitetail. Mm -hmm. And so I'll be heading up there for November 15th. And uh, a lot of our family gets together and we'll be staying at deer camp. And uh, we'll be, I'm sure that we'll be doing, you know, trading some memories of grandpa. It's going to be our first year without him. So was he going up there every year? Yeah. So he, in the last few years, he hasn't actually slept up there, but his house is legitimately uh, about a quarter of a mile away. Oh, okay. And so he, he would come up every morning and, and, you know, have breakfast with us and then obviously dinner with us every single night. So even though he didn't sleep there any longer for the last few years, he, he was still a very large part of it. And yes, he was still, he was still going out and hunting up until, uh, I guess last year was the first time he didn't. Oh man. Well, he'll be there with you in spirit. You'll, you'll hear his, uh, you'll feel his spirit in the wind. Yeah. No Maybe doubt. he'll bring a big eight point to you. I hope so. hope so. <laughs> You know, what's funny that I say this a lot because it happens a lot on this show, Craig, is I'm so surprised. This is the 132nd episode. I learned during this, the doing of this show the past close to three years now, two, uh, yeah, two months, three months shy of three years, how many top leaders, CEOs, exec or really just people who are doing really cool stuff with their life, I'm shocked at how many of those come from small towns. I, I never would have guessed that. Um, I never saw empirical studies or research on it, but I would venture to say when I, and I can't say not, I would say probably 75% of the people who I coach who are on a high leadership level in an organization that I've talked to on this uh, podcast have come from a small town. I, the, I think the smallest was a lady who had eight in her graduating class. Okay. I, yeah, I, that's so got me even. That's crazy. It, it, you know, I'm not, and I'm choosing my, I'm not choosing podcast guests to come on based on that. So it's not, it's, it's somewhat random in that case. So there's got to be something to that. Where I, I definitely think, yeah, I, for me personally, uh, and I would say that, you know, for a while, the way that our family dynamic shook out, I was the youngest grandchild for quite a while. And so I was definitely babied a lot more than even my brother, who's four years older than me. Um, but you know, it's really hard to have an original thought these days with everything going on in podcasting world and everything with TikTok and stuff like that. But I, I think I read something the other day that there's some crazy percentage of, um, success if you were forced to do chores as a kid. Oh yeah. 
And so um, for us, you we're, with where you're from, by the time, especially, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, it wasn't really a question of if you were going to get a job. It was what you were, what were you going to do? And my grandfather uh, was extremely successful growing up. He, he actually did a job that I'm sure most people would, didn't, didn't even really realize was a thing. But basically what he did was he started his own fleet of uh, basically semi-trucks that would go around the UP and the state of Wisconsin. They would go to the farmers, the dairy farmers, get all of their milk and then transport that to the cheese factories. And so he, that's how he made his living. And then at the same time, he always kind of, he always worked uh, out in the woods and cut lumber. And so he did, I mean, he, he did all the hard work and we started, he kind of started having us help uh, myself and all of my cousins uh, at a pretty young age. And so, you know, my brother, I know started when he was eight or nine, I think I was 11 or 12 uh, during the summers, you'd go out there and help. And so you really learned uh, hard work early and the importance of it. And, you know, he would be there at, you know, six thirty, seven o'clock in the morning to pick you up and you were ready and you got out there. And, um, he was, like I said, it's just a great role model in that way. And then there's a lot of odd jobs that you can do in the UP, yeah. <laughs> a lot of hard labor. I mean, I picked sap for a local maple syrup distributor. That might've been one of the, one of the tougher jobs. Cause you're constantly carrying around five gallon buckets of, of sap and you're kind of trudging through, you know, snow that's just melting in March. So you're kind of wet and stuff like that. I mean, I picked rocks. I, uh, I did a lot of hay for a lot of local farmers. So there was no shortage of, of jobs in the area, but usually it was hard labor. And I think that that sets a pretty good tone and gives you a lot of perspective when you start to move into the professional world. I think you're exactly right. I think there's one other aspect to setting a good tone too. growing up in small community is that you, you understand how to communicate and connect with individuals. You know, when I, and I've lived in Detroit, Grand Rapids, Lansing, Ann Arbor, which I loved all those areas. But there is, when you, when you walk into, when you're in a city and you go into a grocery store or, or go to get gas, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to run into somebody you know, you know, unless it's a smaller bedroom community, you know, or a suburb. But when you're in a smaller community, you're constant, constantly being, um, exposed to people you know and they they want a conversation i mean when i go home to st ignace which and when i do go i don't ever go anywhere i'll run to get a pasty or i'll run to get gas or i'll go to the grocery store and get a few things i almost inevitably see somebody i know that i can talk to for a few minutes um sometimes i don't remember who they are they have to say their name um that happens a lot where i'll say can i ask who i'm talking to but then once they say it the connection's there because sometimes it's been 35 years since i've seen them but I think that's it too. We were forced in these small communities to have conversations with people. Um, you can't just ignore somebody who your mom knows, or your dad knows, or your you know is a neighbor of your best friend or something because they're going to think you're rude. But in the city, you can kind of get away with that because there's just so many people. I never, to be honest, I've never really thought about it that way. As far as maybe the people skills or you know the ability to, because yeah, now that I live in Detroit. Uh, it's not often that I go anywhere and see anybody that I know. Um, obviously when I walk into the restaurants, it's much different, but, um, but yeah, I mean, back up North, especially where I'm from, uh, you're gonna absolutely, even if I go back today and I don't live there for 20 years, if you go get gas or you go to the local restaurant, you're absolutely going to bump into somebody, you know, and you're right. I mean, you never, you're always going to talk to that person or at least say hi. So I think it, it, it's a really good point. Well, I don't think there's, there's too many better qualities for a leader or any person to have than work ethic and people skills. Those are fairly foundational to a good life, and they do tend to come from small towns a lot of times. You can get them from living in the city too if you do it right, but I think you have to be more, you have to be more conscious of it in a bigger city. Craig, yeah, what would, no what, doubt. What would you say in the last? I mean, you've gone through some changes. You know, you've been married and you've had Fiona, and you've been promoted to CEO. What in that course of that time frame has been your biggest learning? Well, I think balance right I, you know i am a i have been in a pretty unique situation as has, was my wife where we met very late in life and neither one of us were previously married neither one of us had kids and so we met uh, i was 38 she was 37 and so um you know we met and very quickly uh though cliche fell in love very fairly quickly and obviously had fiona fairly quickly after that so that in amongst um you know, getting moved into this new position 
it just really causes me to be very organized, very prepared uh, to make sure that I am uh, being the best husband and father that I can be. But also I have a lot of responsibility that I owe to our company and to the owners of our company and to all the employees of our company. So uh, just finding the balance uh, to be able to be good at both things, you know, for the first really 15, 20 years of my career, whether I was working at an hourly position um, back in Mount Pleasant where I went to school or whether I was managing, I really only had to focus on, uh, on being a manager. So I could grind with the best of them and I would work long hours and there were really no repercussions to that. I mean, clearly I, over the years with moving away from the UP, uh, I did lose out on a lot of opportunity to spend time with family. And it just was really challenging because as you know, and most people know, nights, weekends, holidays, that's what the restaurants are. And so getting away to the UP to visit my family was really challenging. And I definitely didn't do a great job of prioritizing that over the years. And now that I have a wife and, and, a, and a baby girl, it's not an option anymore. I, I have to prioritize them. They're, they're the, the thing that matters the most. So again, just continuing to get better at that balance and get better at making sure again, that I'm upholding all the responsibilities that I have. And that balance is a, is a juggernaut for so many people who are who are pr- being promoted in life and, and advancing in life and expanding their lives. So what you're what I'm hearing you say, one of the best ways you, you what, things that you keep in mind is that Chelsea and Fiona are the reason why you do what you do. You have a lot of responsibilities to your family, but you also have the responsibilities to your to uh, you know Hopcat to Barfly, and how you're doing that you're just staying more organized and being more prepared. Is that, can you, can you expand on that a little bit? I want to hear a little bit more about how you get that balance, how you, how you feel like you're creating, being able to maintain as much balance as possible. Yeah. So, you know, our, our support office is actually in Grand Rapids and I live over here on the, on the east side of the state. And so that has been challenging because there are certain things that happen in the support office that I absolutely need to be there for. And I need to be able to set the tone for our support office team and and be there when they're there. And we also have some meetings that are important for me to be in person. And so really kind of looking at things, you know, in two to three week chunks and knowing that this is going to be a particular, like this part particular week that that we're in right now, I was in in Grand Rapids from, you know, Tuesday morning up until uh, yesterday evening. And so clearly I have to be away from my wife and Fiona during those times, which is, is is really challenging uh, because, Fiona is going to be uh, turning 10 months next week. And so she's in a pretty cool stage where she's doing new things every day and she's super interactive and she's getting closer to walking and she's doing the dad and the mama stuff. So it's really when I'm gone for just a week, I swear she changes so much in just those, those few short days. Um, so just making sure that when I go over to the West side, that not only am I getting uh, FaceTime with all of our important people in the support office, but I'm getting into the restaurants on that side of the state as well. I think I mentioned this earlier, but it's just so important to me. I, one of the most important things to me is to not get disconnected from our operators. I think so many times the decision makers in these companies, especially restaurants, are making decisions and they're losing sight of actually what the job is and what the teams are going through. And so trying to be really intentional about my time uh, walking into the restaurants and, and making sure that I'm talking to the management teams and getting the perspective from the hourly employees and, and, and all of that. So um, that's kind of what I meant by just being more organized around, um, okay, if I'm going to go to Grand Rapids for a, a team meeting that we have in the office on Wednesday, I'm going to make sure and get into the downtown Grand Rapids location on Wednesday evening and into the Beltline location on Thursday and, you know, trying to get over to the Kalamazoo and the Holland locations and, and making sure I'm stopping into Stellas to, to say hi to the management team there. And so just having a good plan and, it, you know, sometimes stuff happens to cause it to be derailed a little bit. And meetings pop up, but but again, just making sure that um, that I'm trying to to get as much face time with the, all the people that matter. Well, I think that was a key word you said is just you're being more intentional. I think so many people look at the word balance or they look at work life balance. They think about it, or I use the word work life blend a lot. But in really the simplest way to do that is just to be intentional. And one of the things that I think of a lot, um, Craig, is I there's a process I use in my mind. I call it EPS. EPS stands for effective, proficient, sufficient. And when how when I felt at times where my life work life blend or balance was off, I forced myself during the course of the day to stop and say, okay, 
are you being effective with your time? Are you being proficient? And are you being doing it a sufficient amount? Meaning being effective with your time means am I right now, am I doing the right thing right now? That's effective use of my time. If the answer is no, I don't do that thing. If the answer is yes, I say, okay, I'm doing the right thing, but am I being proficient with it? Meaning am I doing it the right way? You know, I could do the right thing, but I could be doing it the wrong way. Like going to Grand Rapids is the right thing. But if you went over there and didn't meet with people and, you know, just kind of wandered around, that would not, you would not meet the proficiency um, criteria. You're doing the right thing. Yeah. You're on site. But, and then the last thing, so if I'm, if I'm, if I'm doing the right thing and I'm doing it the right way, effective and proficient, then the next thing is sufficiency. Am I doing it the right amount? You know, I, am I doing it too much or too little? And those, when you're doing the right thing, being effective with your time, doing it the right way, being proficient with your time, and you're uh, doing it the right amount, sufficiency, it tends to work itself out. And that's a very more specific way to be intentional about the time that you have and the time that you spend. I really like the idea of looking at things in two two to three week chunks. I think more, more people need to do that versus the day. We, we tend to look at things by the day or by the week. But when you start projecting two to three weeks out there in your calendar, you can start seeing roadblocks and traps that might come up that you can fill in or, or overcome when they do come up. So I, I think that's a good piece of advice. And I think the key word is doing it with more intention, as I think a lot of people can take away from that. Um, no question. This is my one of my the deeper questions that we ask, and you answer it the way you want, my friend. But the question is, um, what is one of the more challenging things you've gone through in your life, and how did you overcome it? Yeah, so I don't want to be too vague on this, but it's it's kind of something that that was important for me to, to talk with you about today, just because I think that there are a lot of people that have gone through similar things that I have gone through. I don't, I don't think I've, I have not had the, the cookie cutter um, path to, to be a CEO of a, a company our size that most people have, you know, but I don't have a degree, for example, I did go to school, but I ended up not finishing up. Um, and so I, I think that the grind that I started back when I started as a, even just a line cook, even when I was 20 years old, and then, you know, I moved from a line cook into to positions that were making a little bit more money. I bartended for a while. And that was obviously when I really kind of got sucked into the industry because you can make a fair amount of money in short periods of time without having a lot of responsibility necessarily. And so in that time frame, I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, even once I um, basically to, to try to not you know make this into a 30 minute story, as I was bartending, I also got my insurance license. I worked for a family, uh, the Hunters in Mount Pleasant, absolutely amazing family. I uh, still feel uh, great about my relationship with them today. Uh, John Hunter came to me, who is, is now the owner of the businesses, and he kind of said, hey, I recognize that you probably are looking for a little bit more. I know that you got your insurance license. And by the way, the insurance thing did not work out. It was not That was not for me. Uh, but he said, how would you like to be the general manager of one of our other locations? And of course, I said, I said yes. And I, I started, that's kind of when, when I was 25, I finally started to sort of make moves to to really better my career and get a little bit more of a of a resume to to continue to work towards more. And so, but even once I became a manager of that location, I ended up working for the Hunters for another five years after that, and was kind of by the time I left in 2014, I was sort of overseeing three different places. Uh, and some of our Michigan listeners, I'm sure, will recognize the name Wayside, um, oh, yeah. as that's been around for a lot of years. Uh, but O'Kelly's in the Wayside, and then the Cabin were the three locations that I was overseeing. Um, but in amongst those years, I, I again made a lot of mistakes. I mean, I, I'm still paying off a uh, student loan debt today that I accrued without even getting a degree. So I think, you know, over the years, I, I wanted to be. The more that I have gotten opportunities to to be in executive levels, I, authenticity is extremely important to me. Mm-hmm. And I could sit here and I could avoid talking about stuff like that. But, you know, between getting sucked into the industry, having my priorities backwards, um, not getting home to my to see my family as much as I should have, um, prioritizing, you know, going, going out and socializing with my friends more than I than I probably should have at times. Um, so I would just say that that grind that I had, especially when I started managing, uh, when I was 25, all the way up until I um, became an area director in 2019 for Hopcat, 
I mean, there was a lot of moving around. I, I was a, a, the guy that really did see himself having a family. And so clearly when I was moving around to, you know, Detroit and then moving to Lincoln, Nebraska, and then to Kalamazoo and then back to Royal Oak, it was really hard to meet somebody at that point in time. And so, you know, you kind of get into your mid to late thirties and you start to panic a little bit and say, man, I, I maybe, maybe the family thing is just not going to happen for me. And so, you know, though there was a lot of really fantastic memories in that time frame, I would say that there was also a lot of uh, times that I needed reassurance from a lot of the leaders in my life at the time that this was the right thing to do to, to continue to really grind, like I said, and put my head down and, and work really hard uh, in the restaurant setting. You know, th- those are some stories I haven't even heard yet. We might have brushed over on those in a conversation, but I, I didn't realize that you were connected to the wayside and the cabin. Yeah, yeah, I guess we haven't really we haven't really discussed them on pleasant days all that much. But. <laughs> that's another that's another uh similarity we have or a commonality. We both went to CMU. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The rugby team spent us we spent a fair amount at Wayside, but then I don't know if Nick's saloon was still there when you were there. Um, I don't recognize that name. Yeah, he op- Nick opened up a bar on Mission. I think it's Mission. Is that Mission Street? I, the main road that goes yeah, to the highway, yeah. whatever the highway there. Yeah, he opened up a bar and he let it become the rugby bar where we, I think Wednesdays were like the lowest night for people coming in, or Tuesday or Wednesdays. And then he, we proposed to him, hey, we'll come in. We have the bounce. We'll be the bouncers. You know, we had a couple guys who bounced. We'll call it rugby night. And we get half of the door, the cover charge. Because we need to raise money for travel and stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we are a, a Peanut butter and jelly kind of scholarship program, and um, he said yes. And I think after like a month or two, Wednesdays was the night to be at Nick's Saloon, and so we'd go in there, and you know we'd be able to drink for free sometimes. And that became then he opened up Nick's nine one one out by the I think by the casino that way it was so many mm. years ago, and that became a higher end bar. We'd go there sometimes too, but uh, we we hung a fair share at the at the cabin, went down there and played pool and foosball, and then of course wayside for um, dancing. I guess back in the day, it was a long time ago. I, I get yeah. your I get your um your story about you know so when you you and Chelsea were in your mid to late thirties before you met, we were yeah yeah, yep. and when you're when you're traveling and you're working like that and you get to a point when you're in your mid thirties and you wonder will I ever get married that's almost a, it's a little bit of a daunting uh, thought process because everybody you know has been has married many of your friends have been married ten fifteen years you know yeah exactly and that you know I went through a time time frame of my early 20s where I stood and I, I don't even know I felt like it was nine or ten weddings in two years and so you know again as the you start sort of I think in the beginning of it all you start to panic a little bit uh but ultimately you know I, it is a very social job right so working in the restaurants is a social job so it's not like I uh was a recluse and, and wasn't able to meet people um but you do start to put some of that pressure on yourself and the, the thing that i think both chelsea and i agreed upon after we you know the dust settled of meeting each other is that you know we were both i think when you start looking for it i mean everybody says this right when you're looking for at least it, it just kind of comes out of nowhere and happens really quickly and that's kind of what that's definitely what happened with, with her and i i think that's why da- dating dating apps don't work very well there's too much desperation in them. You know, I, yeah. you know, I had my, my daughter was born when I was just two months shy of my 20th birthday. So I was a very young parent. My beautiful daughter, Ashley, who's now married and has my grandson, Jack. Um, and then I really, you know, I dated after that, but it was when I was, uh, but not, you know, I dated. I met some amazing women who are still great friends of mine today. But I was single for a while, and I was traveling to uh, Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington quite a bit. And I was, I think, 34. Craig, I think it was 34. And I remember sitting at a hotel and I don't even, or not a hotel, a airport. I was on the floor and I don't know why I was sitting on the floor of the airport. It must've been the seats were taken. I don't know. Waiting for the next, next flight. And I was, I think I was coming home, but I was in a layover somewhere and maybe Denver because Denver seemed to be a, a stop. We made a lot. And I remember watching this family. It was a husband and wife and two young kids coming in and they were clearly going on vacation. And I remember thinking that will never be me. My daughter at that time was 15, 16 years old. Um, she was going to be going to college in two years. And I said, I will never get married. I'll never have another little kid in my life. And I remember I literally sat on the floor and started crying. And I, was, I wasn't bawling like where people know but there were tears in my eyes. And then within a year, I, I met a, a lady, got married, and we had, I inherited three amazing uh, bonus sons. And then we had my son, Dawson. 
And it just turned around. But because at that time, I wasn't looking for it because my schedule didn't allow it. I was with clients when I was traveling. When I was home, I was with I was with my daughter. Um, But it was like I just kind of gave up on the idea. And when I gave up on the idea, it kind of worked out. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. When you chase it. Yeah. Very very (laughs) similar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Craig, now that you're, you know, Fiona's 10 months old, you're the CEO of of Barfly Hopcat, uh, Hopcat. What's a win for you in life? When you see something in life that says that's a victory, what would that look like? Oh, I, I would say, again, I don't mean to be um, a little avoidant of giving you a very direct, easy answer. I mean, clearly for me, Fiona and Chelsea are, are, are by far my, my biggest win. And it's just every day gets gets better, you know, and – that has been amazing, but I would say, you know, clearly I've been with Hopcat for the last 10 years and it's been a humongous part of my life. I've met some incredible people that, you know, that I still work with today. I've, met, I've also worked with some incredible people that have gone through my life and, and moved on to different opportunities. But for me, I, I really, I, I was a huge sports guy growing up. Basketball was, was, I, I loved it. And so I like being on a team and mm-hmm. The first time I, I joined Hopcat my first year, I was used to sort of managing places with kind of by myself or with one or one or two other assistant managers. And so when I when I jumped on board with Hopcat Detroit, I mean, I think we had nine or 10 managers on our team at the time. And so I just remembered really quickly, oh, wow, this is amazing. I mean, I have all these people that not only can I can I lean on to help, but I can also learn from. And so just as our organ general you know, whether it's at the support office and having a really impactful meeting with our team or whether it's when you're walking into the restaurant and just walking all, watching all the moving parts work really well to run a super efficient and really great shift to make sure that our guest is having a great time. I just being watching our team members, you know, when you our our management teams are almost all internal promotes. And so being able to, you know, be part of this team and watch all of our, team members continue to grow and get opportunities. And, you know, I've, I've told this story a lot of different times. I've run a lot of orientations uh, as a general manager. And obviously when you're bringing in a, a new team member, you have an orientation to talk through, you know, the company culture and policies and expectations and all the different things that you do when you're onboarding a new employee. I've used this example a lot. You know, we have, we had a young lady named Keisha White who was on our team in Royal Oak. I believe she came on board when I wasn't even a manager there, there yet, but she came in, came in as a dishwasher and she just very quickly just rose through the ranks. I mean, she went from a dishwasher to a line cook from a line cook to uh, one of our trainers that would go to other locations and help us open new stores from one of those trainers to being a lead. That's basically an extension of management. And then from being a lead to a salary manager, who's now getting, you know, salary benefits, uh, PTO, and so watching folks and, and being able to be an organization that really values promotion from within and watching all of these people grow, not just as, you know, opportunities arise, but grow as people and, and really improve as we're working with them is incredibly rewarding. And that's still the biggest thing that I, that I look forward to every day. That's a, that's interesting that, that you say I like being on a team because I think again I'm going to go back I think be, growing up in a in a smaller community there is more of that team environment you're helping people you're helping neighbors you're helping relatives um, even being on sports obviously is a big factor and a lot of times it's easier to be on a sports team in a smaller community than it is to make a sports team in a bigger school in a bigger city so I think that's mm-hmm. another aspect of a positivity of a uh, positive of growing up in a small community that we sometimes took for granted. I know I did. And I'm just, I'm learning a few more things today about how blessed not only you, but how I was growing up in a small community. Um, this is my favorite question. It's my time machine question. And if I were to come down today, I'm going to come to Detroit and I'm going to pull my time machine in my trailer and we're going to get in it. You're going to go back to any time in your life, Craig, that you want to go to. I don't care if you're five years old or 25 or 35. And you could talk to your former self. I'm just going to sit back and listen and observe. What would you say to the younger Craig stage? What advice, words of wisdom would you share with yourself? Well, I, I just learned to be more balanced um, in everything. 
you know, I think that as you know, in the last four or five years and you really get solidified in a career, you start to really figure out who you are, you know, what, what matters to you the most. And, you know, and of course we're in this, we're not going to talk politics today, but again, even, even in that realm balance, it's just about balance. There, there is a, there is a right answer in there somewhere in the balance. Right. Right. And so I think as a, as a younger person that was in the industry at a pretty young age, I would say through my college career and, and since the time that I moved away from home when I was 20 years old, I just would, would tell myself to just make sure that I, I use balance a lot more. And, and what I mean by that is, is just prioritizing uh, different things much better. And it was really easy for me to find excuses to not drive home to see my family. And, you know, I have uh, two nephews and a niece and, you know, I didn't, I wasn't there a lot for their upbringing because I was, I was working a lot of nights and weekends. And so, you know, I would use the excuse, well, I'm not going to go home because I have my days off are usually Monday and Tuesday. Well, everybody's working on Monday and Tuesday or the kids are at school on Monday and Tuesday. And so I just, I, at this state, state of my career and in my personal life, I really hate excuses. And so I, I wish I would have made less excuses to make sure that I prioritize the right things um, at an earlier age. I mean, I, I made a lot of really unbelievable friends over the years and a lot of them are still in my life today. Um, unfortunately, you, you know, just as life happens, you, you do start to sort of disconnect with some of them, not by, not intentionally, but it just happens. Um, but again, your family's forever and your family's what, what means the most and, and what's most important. And I, I think that I could have done a lot better job of, of just making sure that that was the, the priority of my life, uh, even through the, my early twenties. Well, it goes right back to what you said earlier about living intentionally. You know, and yeah. I think I, yeah. I always call it conscious living. I do a thing called a conscious living reminder. It's just something I created a few years ago that makes me, there's certain things that I want to make sure I do every week that kind of encompass my life holistically from family to my health, to my business, um, you know, in my intellectual, financial, whatever. And I make sure I do certain amount of things every week. And I've noticed, I call them found, my foundationals is really what I think of them as. And when I started making sure I'm doing certain things every week, like whether it's just how many times I call my mom, you know, t text my mom, you know, brother, sister, whatever, kids, you know, how much protein I put in my body every day, water I drink, you know, vitamins. And it's, it's like 30, I think there are 33 things. And my goal is to get 25 every week. I don't get them all because I don't like meditation. And that's one I never get. <laughs> um, yeah. but I never get that one. I got to either take that one out or pick my, get off my ass and do it. Um, but I think that isn't so important for a lot of us. And I think if a lot of us could go back in our lives, I know for me, that would be one of the, the words of wisdom I would share with my, you know, 25 or 20 year old self is, you know, be intentional, be way more intentional, less spontaneous, uh, be more, set your priorities right now because they're going to have a major impact on you when you're 57 years old. Yeah, no question. I, I do think too, you know, our industry uh, in the hospitality industry is, the, I mean, I've met the most, I mean, we have hourly employees right now that are some of the most interesting and, and most talented people that you can possibly imagine. And I really, I, I just have always been fascinated by our, by our teams. I think that their, their abilities and their, how smart these people are and how insightful they are about even certain operational things. That's why I like asking a lot of our employees, you know, what they think of certain things if I'm in the site. And I do think that people in this industry put a lot of pressure on themselves that feel like they have to get out of the industry. And I, I really, I mean, I'm clearly not going to change people's minds on that, but I think that people have to understand that, you know, there's a lot of challenging industries out there. And I think that people have to give themselves a lot more credit. I mean, I know I did, I diminished myself uh, back when I was bartending and I always felt a lot of pressure to, to not, what are you going to bartend forever and, and say those types of things for, to myself. But, but really, you know, there's a lot of jobs that have really tough hours. And yeah. so it's just really, really understanding that, you know, this can be a foot in the door to more, to bigger things, but also if you're happy doing this, this is a perfectly lucrative and, and great career to have and you can have an impact on a lot of different people so and you meet so many people no doubt i, I mean, mean it's it's incredible there's a lot i mean we have i think we're around a thousand employees right now with 12 locations and so you know you can do the math obviously we have around 20 at our support office but there's i mean our teams most of our teams are so close-knit and there are people that have 
you know, everybody's friends, it seems like on the teams. And there's a lot of, a lot of people to go to, to, uh, to feel like you're, you know, you're kind of in a, a family environment. Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's, it's my favorite place to go. And if there's one around and I have, a, I have an option between that and the competition, it's going to be Hopcat every time. I like the feel, I like the, the feel of the places inside too. They have a eclectic feel. And what are the fries? They're cosmic fries. <laughs> and we will not, we, we, won't, <laughs> we won't get into that <laughs> no, today. But, but, they uh, are the best fries you've ever had. I can tell you that. And that's one of the things I will splurge on. I don't care if I'm eating well. You know, if I'm, you know, I, I have a pretty weird diet, but when I go and get, and I can get fries somewhere, I'm getting fries. I love fries and ketchup and the cosmic fries are the best fries I've ever had. And every time I've gone to a hop cat, I know there was a former name for them before, um, but everybody would always, that's what they wanted. They'd go in there that we're going to get those. And I'm like, before I remember the first time, I'm like, what, what are these things? And uh, it was in Grand Rapids <laughs> and I think it was Grand Rapids or yeah, it must've been. And I'm like, all right, we'll try them. And I'm like, whoa. And me being a fry guy. I was hooked. Now, the last time I was in the East Lansing, when I just went in for a beer and I didn't, um, I didn't get fries. I didn't eat that day. I just, uh, my date and I went in there for, uh, for just a, I think we had two drinks and we were just wandering around downtown East Lansing last summer, early last summer. So, but, uh, that I usually, those are always on the menu, no matter who goes in there, who I go in there with. One of us is getting the cosmic fries. Yeah. I mean, it's a definitely, definitely a fan favorite. And most people that come here, definitely, uh, even if they're going to have a beer, usually they order, order some fries before they leave. Yeah, I'm sure those fries make you drink a couple more beers too. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely they're well seasoned. Flavored. No yeah, they're well seasoned. Yeah, but you know yep. the thing is, I don't like a lot of salt. I don't put salt on any food. I don't find those salty. They're, it's not the it's not a salty flavor. Like I don't eat pretzels because I don't like salt. Um, I don't put you know I just don't put salt in anything. If something's too salty, I just I just don't eat it. Um, but those aren't salty. They're just seasoned right. And maybe it's salt. I yeah. don't know. But they don't have that salty bitter. Like, oh, I want to drink a gallon of water after I'm done eating them. They don't have that at all. They have a really good flavor. Yeah, a lot of different flavors going on in there. It's uh, to this day, I still don't know the exact recipe, <laughs> um, but I, I do know that you know it's some some sweet flavors and obviously some savory flavors. So, um, what's next for you, Craig? Personal or professional? Well, again, I you know it's hard to it's hard to think about one without thinking about the other, right? Uh, especially now in this new role. Uh, I mean, I'm only in, let's see, July, August, I'm only in month four of this new role. And then again, I have a 10 month old and I have uh, a wife. And so just continuing to try to get better and better each day uh, at not just being a, a father and husband, but, but also just really finding my groove as the, as the CEO of our company. You know, I'm really, I've been so ops focused for my whole career with Hopcat where I really love being in the sites and that's what I know the most mm -hmm. and, um, getting better at, uh, you know, the quote unquote CEO things, um, while still being boots on the ground and while still being front facing with our employees is something that, you know, I have to, I have to really dig in and plan for every single week. And so, uh, I, I think our organization is a fantastic spot right now and we're going to be focused on trying to open more restaurants in 2025. Um, and so just continuing to be collaborative and uh, like I always say, it's extremely important to me to, to never be making decisions in a silo. We have an extremely talented CFO, him and I work really well together, but it's not just us too. You know, we, we put uh, the decision making on, on the larger team and making sure that we're getting insight from not just our managers, not just our uh, support office staff, but our, but our hourly employees as well. And, just again, continuing to, to do that. And again, just trying to be as present as I can for, for both Chelsea and Fiona. I love it. Well, we talked about this before that being a CEO, there's so many hats to wear. you got to be at the ground level. You have to be at 10,000 feet. Then you have to be at cruising altitude to 30, 30,000. You have to operate on all three of those levels simultaneously. And that's, and that's why not many people make it to the CEO level. That's a very difficult balance. And then having yeah. a family and having a young family. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely challenging, but uh, but a challenge that I am very happy to have and, and and happy to continue to work on. Well, the one thing I've learned to respect about you, Craig, is that you do focus a lot on self development, professionally and personally. You know, you're one of the uh, few clients that actively seeks leadership uh, information, knowledge, and wisdom, and new ideas, and not just from you know. I know you do from from um, Ned, of course, you and I get a chance to talk quite a bit, but you also are looking for ideas. You're always seem like your mind is looking for ways to make Hopcat better for 
the people that are the teams, the team there, as well as the guests that come in the door. And that's a really good quality because a lot of people can get real stale with that. And they just see the position as a position, not as a work in progress that has to continue to develop. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of holes in my game. And so I'm just trying to get better every day. I mean, I think that if someone is, is ignorant enough to think that they have all the answers in this day and age with as much of information as at our fingertips, uh, I think that that's just not a great quality, especially a, a leadership quality. And so, you know, there are certain things that, you know, it's the reason we have a support team. There's a lot of things that our team is better at than I'm at, than I am. And so continue to learn through them, uh, learn through folks like you, uh, learn through reading and talking to other leaders in the industries. And, you know, it's something that I really enjoy about it. And I, I'm never going to be the guy that thinks he has all the answers. That's for sure. I can tell you the best source of learning and wisdom is going to come from your wife and your daughter. Yeah, no it, doubt. I mean, no, she, watching children grow up is you learn more about life than anybody could ever teach you or any book you could ever read because that is the, I mean, the way they grow and learn and expand in life is that is leadership. I mean, you're leading them, you and Chelsea are leading Fiona, you're leading each other, your teamwork uh, your, that you have together. And then those child, that child is leading themselves and watching them stumble when they try to walk, but they don't give up. They, they try to stand up and walk again. And there's so many little life lessons in watching a child grow and not even, they don't stop at 18. They continue to, if they're, their, if they're your child, you continue to watch them and see them make mistakes and learn and how they handle things. And you're thinking, wow, did I teach them that? I don't think I did. They got that on their own. I learned from watching my kids so often, and I'll write things down in my journal and go, I don't think I taught them that. No, they're teaching me that by just observing them. And they both teach me things with their mouth because they both are pretty vocal people. And uh, yeah. they'll, they'll say things to me. I'm my, you know, my son one time, my daughter tells me I'm, in, I'm impatient, and uh, she's finally convinced me that I'm, I am. I always thought I just had high standards for other people. But really, she <laughs> taught me, no, Dad, you're impatient. you got to work on that. And my son is always there to tell me the thing you, do, you don't want to do at the moment, Dad, is probably the thing you should be doing at the moment. So I, I learn a lot. Those are just little things I've learned from my kids so far. There's a whole book of those things in my journals. So keep learning from yeah, Fiona, my friend. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that to that stage. I mean, there's already things she does that I, I just am amazed by, you know, even at the, the young age of nine, nine to ten months. And, and there's nothing important that I don't run by my wife. She's uh, very insightful, uh, really intelligent. So it's definitely been, uh, you know, there's a lot of important things that happen in my job and that have, have happened in my job that I definitely run by her. And she's been, she's been extremely insightful, that's for sure. Well, you threw her blessed, that's for sure. Oh, okay, my final question, Craig, is... Is there any question I did not ask that you wish I would have? Is there, or is there any final message that you would like to leave with the Bamboo Pack? No, I mean, I really feel feel great about all the things we've touched on. I, I, I just think that um, I, I really like to just keep things in perspective. Uh, you know, we all have bad days. And I, I just think that when, when we have a bad day, I want you to really think deeply about what our bad days mean to some others' bad days. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now where if you can't provide yourself some perspective for some of the really tragic things that have been happening for the last couple of years and just truly understand that you can t- maybe take a step back and be grateful for the things that we actually have, especially in this country – um, I, I just try to live in the moment and really appreciate the things that we do have and, and not get too caught up for too long on, on maybe a bad day here or there. Because again, our bad days are pretty damn good in, in my opinion. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Sometimes I think about when we complain and I complain sometimes too, that I, I look around and think how many, what population of the planet would trade lives with me? It's <laughs> yeah, a, it's a, great, a very big population. Yeah. It's a large percentage of the population. And I, it, it humbles me right away. Yep. I love that. Keep things in perspective, into perspective, especially when you're having a bad day. Yep. Brother, this was amazing. I'm so glad we got a chance to talk. I knew I wanted to get you on here. I've been wanting to for the past couple of months, but uh, I know we're, you're busy. And I'm so glad you came on. And keep doing what you're doing, man. You've got the right perspective. I love the idea of balance and priorities. I love the idea of being intentional with your thought process and how you use your time and your resources and energy. 
That's the quality that makes a great leader. It really is. And it, it's very clear that your perspective or your, your focus is on the people. It, it is. I mean, I have a, I've had people say it to me, but then I don't see it in their, in their actions. Uh, you say it in your words and you carry it in your actions um, every time I, I talk to you. And I do believe um, that uh, Hopcat and Stella's is much better off for it. And it's going to continue to get better and better because of your leadership. Well, Brian, I can't thank you enough. This was really fun, and uh, I'm really looking forward to you know continuing our relationship, and, and I know we'll be talking again soon. Yeah, well, don't hang up yet. I want to talk to you after we're done. Okay. Okay, all right. All right, Craig, thanks for being such an inspiring guest on the Bamboo Lab Podcast, buddy. Thanks. All right, everybody. Hey, I want to ask everybody out there, if you are in an area where there is a hot cap, and you're looking for an employee, some, a place to go to be part of a team, to learn, to learn from people like Craig, the leadership team, the general managers, the managers, the other staff that are there. I'm going to ask you to just give it a look, man. Give it a look. I've been in a lot of restaurants in my life. Um, I love the environment. I love the culture that Hopcat and Stella's represents. I think it's a great opportunity for any person to go and say, hey, I want to give this a try and be part of a team. And if you're in a location looking for a great drink and some great food and some cosmic fries and some great service, if you see a Hopcat on Yelp or on Google or you run, drive by one, pull in and have a drink and have a meal. Everybody out there, I appreciate you all tuning in today. I'll talk to you all on one week from today, same time, same place. In the meantime, I'm going to ask you to please get out there and strive to give and to be your best. Please show love and respect to others and back to yourself as well. And please live intentionally and live with purpose. I thank you all, each and every one of you. Until next time.